Hello everyone, I'm Robin Pearson, and I'm here to show you what remains of the Church of the Theotokos Curiotissa in Istanbul. Though this church may be new to you, the story of its artistic and architectural history carries within it an outline of the entire history of Constantinople, including the only known piece of art produced during the Crusader occupation in the 13th century. This is what the Church of the Theotokos Kyriotissa looks like today. It is now called the Kalendahane Mosque. The building was excavated and restored in the 1960s, which is when the fascinating history of this site came to life. We are here, right in the centre of Istanbul, as well as here, at the far end of the surviving stretch of the Aqueduct of Valens. The aqueduct was completed in the 360s AD, when bathhouses were still a major part of Roman life, and the first structure that was built on this site was indeed a bathhouse. Erected around 400 AD, it was built right up against the line of the aqueduct, presumably to take advantage of the new water channels. A couple of rooms from the bathhouse still survive today at the back of the building. A couple of hundred years later, we find that the baths have been incorporated into a monastery that now sits on this site. The complex includes a church, which is right up against the aqueduct itself, and this was built in the 570s, still in the era of Justinian, when building projects boomed across the empire. The excavators found this mosaic of the Presentation of Christ in the ruins of that building. It is the only surviving Constantinopolitan icon from before the period of iconoclasm, giving us a rare insight into the art of that period. Moving forward a century, we see that another church has been added to the monastic complex, side by side with the previous one. We now enter the so-called Dark Ages and a rough time for the Roman state. No changes are detected at the site until the older church is demolished for unknown reasons, at some point between the 10th and 12th centuries. Then, in 1197, a terrible fire engulfed the city, which gutted this monastic complex, including the church. This is what led to the building of a new church on the site, which is the building we see today. The Byzantines often reused earlier structures if they could, to avoid the expense of bringing in fresh materials. The new church therefore used bits from the bathhouse and the two previous churches and was still hemmed in by the line of the aqueduct. This led to a rather irregular shape. One of the excavators says that no two sides of the quadrilateral are of the same length, neither pairs of its opposite sides are parallel, and none of its corners are right angles. Despite this, the new building was a fine-looking church, and serious money was lavished on it, including marble revetments for the walls and imagery decorating every surface, as was customary in the post-iconoclasm era. The new church was barely finished before Constantinople fell to the army of the Fourth Crusade. A Latin emperor would rule the city for the next 57 years. During this occupation, many Byzantine churches were converted to the Latin Catholic Rite. But little physical evidence of this period was known until our site was excavated in the 1960s. It was in this side chapel that the exciting discovery was made, the remains of a fresco cycle dedicated to St. Francis of Assisi were uncovered. Why was this exciting? in part because it told us so much that we didn't know, that a Franciscan order were put in charge of the Curiotissa, and that the Latins were actively transforming Orthodox buildings, anticipating the absorption of the Byzantines into the Catholic order. But more significantly, I think, it tells us something about the immediacy of medieval beliefs. You've probably heard of St. Francis of Assisi. He is remembered today for his patronage of animals and the environment. He is often pictured tending to a wounded creature, at times actively encouraging them to join in the worship of their creator. 
Francis gained a popular following and established a new monastic order. He encouraged his charges to live an austere life, owning no property and living off charity as they spread the good news. But in addition to his practical impact, miraculous stories attached themselves to Francis as they did to most saints. Often some time elapses before such stories can gain wide acceptance, but not in this case. Francis only died in 1226, and this fresco cycle was created in the 1250s, well within the lifetime of those who'd known him. That would be like me telling you that Mother Teresa had performed miracles. This cycle even predates the famous paintings in Assisi itself. It's a testament to the passion he stirred in those who met him and the religious fervour of the Crusading Age. Finally then, the Byzantines retook possession of the church in 1261 and walled off the Francis Chapel. They redecorated the rest of this part of the church, and the few frescoes which have survived allowed us to find multiple references to the Theotokos Kyriotissa, the enthroned Mother of God, which is who this church was dedicated to. After the Ottoman conquest, Mehmet II gifted the complex to a calendar dervish sect, hence the name for the modern mosque, Kalendar Hane. The dervishes are most famous today for their whirling Sema ceremony, but they were a religious order who used the church and the surrounding monastic buildings to teach and distribute charity. Apparently, the church was only converted to a mosque in 1746 with the addition of a mihrab, minbar, and other furnishings. Fire and earthquakes damaged the building over the centuries until it was abandoned in the 1930s. It was excavated and restored in the 1960s and 70s, yielding its secrets to us, and was then reopened as a mosque. The restoration preserved a number of Byzantine features which can be seen today. Remnants of the frescoes that once covered the whole building can be spotted just above the doorway as you enter, along with these old Roman capitals that were reused throughout the building. Many of the surviving decorative elements are from the 6th century or earlier. This carved entablature and these marble plaques above the door bear a strong resemblance to other works from Justinian's era. The influence of the Hagia Sophia itself can be seen in the marble revetment which covers the walls and pillars. Though some of these are imitation plaster, about 40% are the original marble. Beyond the surviving features, the space itself gives us a sense of the size and style of Middle Byzantine churches. Behind that walled-up opening lies a real treat, though. These are the side chapels where the frescoes and mosaics can be found. Entering this sealed-off chamber was one of the thrills of my visit to Istanbul, laying eyes on Byzantine images that have been hidden from the public for hundreds of years. The remains of the St. Francis cycle have been moved to the archaeological museum, but these faded frescoes show us famous Orthodox bishops, as was customary in the iconographic programs of Byzantine churches, Hiding in a corner here is the Archangel Michael in mosaic, while over here you can see the Theotokos Kyriotissa herself, sadly now defaced. When this was first uncovered, she and the Christ child were in reasonably good condition, with presumably a wealthy donor to the church below them. Mosques in Istanbul can be visited in the day outside of prayer time, but since Byzantine-interested visitors aren't common, I would suggest going with a tour guide. If you can find a well-connected one, they can ask permission from the imam to let you see in the side chapel. On the other side of the building, you can also see the remains of the bathhouse, though there is little of casual interest there beyond the remains of the floors. To see the St. Francis cycle itself, you need to go to the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. It's in pieces now, but you can still make out parts of his story. Here he preaches to the birds. Above the images is a quote from Psalm 25. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. 
Next to it is this 6th or 7th century mosaic showing the presentation of the baby Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem. You can find the story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. It's an incident which has been regularly captured in art, and this is the first known Byzantine version of that scene. The Theotokos Kyriotissa and its remnants will never be famous relics of the Roman Empire. But in their story, the history of Constantinople plays out. The rise, the fall, the battle over its place in the world, and the need for humans of all faiths to express themselves in masonry and mosaic. If you'd like more detailed information about the Theotokos Kyriotissa, then visit thebyzantinelegacy.com. It's a fantastic website providing breakdowns of the Byzantine buildings that can still be seen today, and there you'll find most of the still images and sketches used in these videos. <laughs>